evening as we rejoice to gather again on the Lord's Day, this Lord's Day evening. We're so thankful to have you all here. We welcome you, members, new members, and friends, and others who might be with us by way of our electronic broadcast by streaming. We welcome you also. We will be having the Lord's Supper this evening, and we will mute the broadcast as well as simply have a slide up during that time, and then you'll join us together at the end after the Lord's Supper for the closing hymn. So that's going to be a bit of a different thing tonight. Once again, I'd urge you, as we did this morning very profitably, to proceed outside as soon as the evening worship is over, and then we can have some more fellowship outside. I think it stopped raining. The rest of it, I think, is uh, fairly obvious. We will have Nathan Curtis ordination whenever he is fully well. <clears throat> we also have many other announcements and prayer requests in the bulletin. And once again, we're going to be having evening service tonight with a new mini-series on the book of Jonah from our intern, Brendan Westerfield. We're thankful to have him continue uh, this series after he finished the Gospel of Luke, after we've been through that for about three years or so, I think, more or less. So we're thankful to have an Old Testament text, and he'll proceed with something else after that mini-series is over. So let's have then a moment of silent prayer preparing to worship the Lord. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, good evening, everyone. And let us begin our worship this evening by singing from God's own word, uh, Psalm 22D in the Psalter hymnal, The ends of all the earth shall hear. Psalm 22D. Please stand as we sing.
together. Oh Lord, our God, as we come to you on the close of another Sabbath day, we are mindful of the ways that you have blessed us in Christ and continue to bless us each and every day through our union with him. Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him? And yet you have covenanted with us, you have cast your love upon us and have sought after us. Lord, we thank you for your deliverance, and we know that we are made so that we may worship you. And Lord, help us to do that tonight. Give us loud voices, uh, comforted hearts, and teach us this evening by your word and spirit. For it's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Please remain standing for our first scripture reading of the evening from Psalm 67. We'll be reading the entirety of the psalm as it speaks of God's plan to reach the peoples who are far off, to reach the Gentiles, and his plan for all time to do such a thing. And we'll see that in the book of Jonah tonight as well. Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, let us join our hearts together in a time of congregational prayer. Let's pray. Our good and gracious God, we are so comforted by the fact that nothing above or here on earth or even below can separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for him. We thank you for his life and his ministry while on this earth, and we thank you for his ongoing ministry as he outpours his spirit upon us as he sits enthroned in the heavens. Lord, we are comforted by your love for us. We are comforted by your sovereignty over all things. And so, Lord, as your people, we come to you knowing that you have the power to change circumstances, and yet, Lord, we do trust in your perfect will in all things. And Lord, we especially call to you this time when we are struggling as a, as a nation and as a world with, with a crisis on our hands. Lord, we do pray that you would give your church in particular grace to be light unto the world, that you would empower us to be speakers of truth into the lives of those who might be fearing a lot of things. And Lord, we also do pray that you would bring an end to this quickly. And Lord, we pray that you would bring comfort to those who have been afflicted, that you would bring healing to those who have been hurt. And Lord, we pray that you would care for your church as you always have. We pray that you would provide those who need jobs with, with employment and that you would continue to heal those who may be finding themselves sick at this time. Lord, for our own church, we do pray for uh, this, uh, this man, Robert Arendale, as he might be coming to candidate soon. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would protect his travels. And Lord, that we pray that you would put it on upon the hearts of the congregation to, uh, to be a prayerful people at this time, to, to pray for this candidate, to, to pray for wisdom as they look to make a decision about the future. And Lord, we do pray for all of the ongoing ministries that are going on in our church uh, we pray for the ESL program as it continues to meet online. Uh, Lord, we do pray that even though this may be a limitation, that it, uh, that it may still work and that it may still produce good fruit and that we may see people even come to know you through that ministry. Lord, we do lift up to you our prayer members this evening, the, the Lees. Uh, we thank you for this family, the blessing that they are to the church. Uh, we pray you would continue to sustain Moon and Julia, as they continue to work, and 
that you would continue to bless the kids as they study, uh, give them perseverance in their studies and diligence and, and good discipline as they move forward. Lord, we lift up to you all of our expectant mothers as well, uh, Rachel Moss and Olivia and Allison. Uh, Lord, we thank you for them again and their blessing that they are to the church, and we pray that you would be with those families as they seek to raise more covenant children, uh, little voices that will continue to praise you as the day is long. Uh, Lord, we do pray for all of those, uh, both inside and outside the church, who may be uh, experiencing loneliness and isolation at this time. And we do pray that your church would be particularly good at at reaching out to such people, at, at providing comfort for them as they look to be comforted. And Lord, let us be a people that is always and eternally pointing to you, pointing to our Savior and pointing to the comfort that we do have in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the new members we received this day. We pray that, uh, that we would be able to serve them well as they serve the church as well. Uh, Lord, we, we love to see your church continue to grow. And Lord, we look to the end of this pandemic so that we can meet in full, in person. And yet, Lord, even in the meantime, we do ask that uh, this would be a, a means of grace to even the people who have to view it from afar, that have to view it through the internet or other means. Lord, we do finally thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit. And we do pray that we would be edified by it this evening. For we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Let us respond with a quick hymn of praise, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, from the Psalter Hymnal number 374. And since we have the Lord's Supper this evening, we will not be doing congregational selections afterwards. So just this one hymn, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, 374. <laughs>
please stand for our sermon text reading this evening. It'll be from the book of Jonah. In your pew Bible, that'll be on page 774. We'll be reading most of the first chapter, verses 1 through 16. And, and as I'm reading, I want you to tune your ears to listen for repeated phrases or repeated words. The author of Jonah uses that to great effect in this book. Uh, so try to listen for some things that are repeated quite frequently. So from Jonah chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, this is the word of our Lord. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it, for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid, and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it has pleased you. So they picked up Jonah, and they hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Amen. Please be seated. All right, let us go to the Lord and ask for, for guidance this evening. Let's pray. Our Lord, our God, we are so thankful that you have spoken and Lord, we do ask that you would give us ears to hear what you've said. Lord, we do pray this evening that uh, your word will be edifying to us, that we may come to know of your plan for all time, and that we may come to love you more and more through this text. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, in many ways, I, I think the book of Jonah needs no introduction but I'm going to give you one anyway. That's just how these things go. Uh, it is known by many. Uh, we've heard it since we were little kids. We've seen the Veggie Tales story. We know all about the great whale and, and of course, the ever bubbly and delightful character of Jonah. Uh, and it's just such a memorable narrative. It's such a memorable narrative. But although all of this is true, I still think that the book of Jonah is a very misunderstood book. In the grand scheme of things, I think Jonah is a very misunderstood book because sometimes 
we can read a book like Jonah as only a historical narrative. Now, it is a historical narrative. Jonah was a real guy. This all happened. But sometimes we can read it as only a historical narrative. And we, we may not ask why this book exists. Why was this book made? Uh, it's not simply a retelling of what happened. This book exists to edify, to teach, and to challenge Israel. To teach and to challenge Israel. This book is not written to Nineveh, the great city that ultimately would repent. This book is written to Israel, and it's written to teach them a lesson. And so what is that lesson? Well, in short, the lesson of Jonah is that God's love, compassion, and mercy is so much bigger than you can imagine. God's mercy and love is so much more far-reaching than Israel could ever imagine. That's why this book was written, to teach them that lesson. Because you see, Israel was very used to being God's chosen people. I think they actually quite liked that, being the chosen ones of God. And yet, this book is written to teach those people, Israel, God's people, now the church, that God's love can reach even those people. Now, whoever those people are, for us, may look different. And we'll talk about that in a second. But those people for Israel were the Gentiles. And more specifically, the Ninevites, those pesky Ninevites. So Jonah, in many ways, is just the gospel in a book. You know, we talked about Luke and how Luke often went back into the Old Testament and picked up pictures and illustrations and context. Well, Jonah, if anything, just reaches way forward into the New Testament and grabs a handful of New Testament grace and soil and brings it back into the, into the Old Testament. And there we see gospel seeds planted in, abund in abundance. There are gospel seeds everywhere in this book. And so as we dive in, uh, let's first look at the plan of the Lord, the plan of the Lord in the book of Jonah. Now, the plan of the Lord is revealed to us in the very first verse, and the plan is pretty simple. It's ultimately to save the Ninevites. We read that, as the Lord said to Jonah, the son of Amittai, arise. That's the first word he says. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up against me. So yes, the Lord plans to use Jonah and all that he is to save Nineveh and all that they are. And that takes a little bit of unpacking. Uh, but Jonah is a very familiar person to all of us, I think. Uh, we've heard his story a thousand times. We've been told it since we were children. Uh, now the name Jonah literally means dove, which will be significant in a few weeks. Uh, but he's also called son of Amittai, which literally means son of my faithfulness. And that's a tremendous gauge for this entire book, because this book is about God's faithfulness to his prophet, not the other way around. This is not a book about Jonah's faithfulness to the Lord, as we'll see. This is a book about God's faithfulness to his purpose and his prophet. Jonah is not the hero of Jonah. Jonah is not the hero of Jonah. God is. In fact, many of us know already that Jonah is just a little ball of angst. Uh, he is a feisty, bitter, disillusioned man, and he is not faithful. And perhaps the most annoying thing about Jonah is that I'm reminded of myself when I read Jonah. And perhaps you are too. I think I can see myself when I read Jonah, fighting the will of the Lord sometimes, displeased with what God would have me do, wrestling with his providence. And so perhaps the worst thing about Jonah is just how relatable he is. And yet the Lord uses him. The Lord uses him 
as a prophet, as his prophet, as his spokesperson. Now, there's certainly a subversion of expectation here. Uh, Jonah is in many ways the exact opposite of what you'd expect from a prophet. You'd expect somebody who is obedient to God, who is super holy, who is willing to suffer and die for God's purposes. In fact, you'd expect someone like Jesus, wouldn't you? And yet that's sort of the point. Jonah is a lesser Jesus. Jesus is a greater Jonah. But that's not what we get here. We get a sort of weak man. And I think this serves the narrative in a couple of very important ways. More broadly speaking, for you and for me, it shows us that God uses extremely flawed people to accomplish his purposes. You are never too broken for God to use you. You were never too sinful for God to use you. He used Jonah, and he can use you. You must never think you're too far gone for the Lord to use you. God has a long history of using very flawed people for his purposes. So that should encourage you, wherever you are, to seek to serve the Lord. Whether you're wrestling with a specific sin, whether you haven't been to church in a while, seek to serve the Lord, because he can use you. But secondly... Jonah's obvious flaws, uh, it kind of clues us into a, a central lesson in the book as a whole. Now let's remember this was written to Israel, and it's meant to challenge them in numerous ways. But one of those big ways is it's meant to humble God's people. It is meant to humble Israel, because Jonah, in many ways, is a stand-in for Israel. Now as we've already talked about, Jonah was a real person. He existed but he's also sort of a representative for Israel. And we'll see that throughout the book in numerous places. And let's be frank. If that's the case, then Jonah does not paint Israel in the best light. Israel doesn't get the good rep from the book of Jonah. And that is absolutely intentional. That is absolutely intentional because it gets to the heart of Jonah's message which is that the love of God can reach further than you can imagine. And as we've established that God's plan is to use Jonah in all that he is, flawed, disobedient, unresponsive to save the Ninevites and all that they are, we'll see why it's so important that Jonah is portrayed so negatively. Because the Ninevites are wicked people. Uh, they are the worst of the worst. Uh, Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, Israel's enemies to the north, and, and they were infamous for just about every sin in the book. But most notably, uh, rampant idolatry and, and just heinous acts of violence. Uh, it is well recorded how violent these people were, barbaric, you could almost say. They were a well and truly wicked people, and yet the God, love of God reaches and changes even these. And so why is Jonah so flawed? Why is a flawed man sent to prophesy to a flawed Nineveh? Well, it's to remind Israel, it's to remind God's people that they are no more deserving of God's love than Nineveh. And as we take that idea and bring it into our own living room, that means that even we who sit here in the pews, we are no more deserving of God's love than those people, whomever they are. Those people may look different for each of us. They may be neighbors. Uh, they may be coworkers. They may be people across the political aisle. God's love can reach even those people. And we know that because it's reached you. That's the lesson of Jonah. So long story short, the Lord plans to use Jonah and all that he is to reach the Gentiles, more specifically Nineveh, and all that they are. And Jonah is a reminder to Israel and us, the church, that we must never underestimate the power of God's mercy and compassion to change people's lives, even those people. And we are living proof of that. So, 
Let's see what God's great prophet does when the Lord speaks to him. So as we look in the presence of the Lord and Jonah fleeing from it, uh, we see that the Lord's first word in this book was to arise. That's the first command given to Jonah. And what does Jonah do? Well, he rises at first, uh, but to flee to Tarshish and away from the presence of the Lord. Now, he is just trying to outrun God. And how do you think this will work out for him? (laughs) Not very well. Not very well. And one thing I, I mentioned earlier is you'll find repetition used a lot in Jonah. If you pay close enough attention, it sort of illustrates these key themes. So now listen close to just one verse for some repetition. I'm going to read verse 3. And listen to what the author has said. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa to find a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. It's almost comical when you slow down and read it slowly. There are three things repeated in this one verse. First of all, he's going away from the presence of the Lord. That's stated twice in this verse alone, three times in the chapter. He is fleeing from God, and he is fleeing from his mission. And we know that because it is mentioned three times that he's going not to Nineveh, but to to Tarshish, to Tarshish, to Tarshish. It's like a tongue twister. Say that five times fast. And last but not least, uh, notice the direction he's going. The Lord's first words to him were, Arise. And yet Jonah goes down, down, down. He goes down to Joppa. He goes down into the ship. Even later, he goes down into the belly. Uh, The Hebrew word is actually the womb of the ship, the same word used for the belly of the fish later. And he lays down to go to sleep. You could almost say that Jonah is just sinking. He is digging down to get away from the presence of the Lord above. Whoever is writing Jonah, perhaps Jonah himself, wants the reader to know undoubtedly that he is simply running away from God. He is angry with God. This is not some sort of uh, atheistic disbelief. Uh, He is very aware of God. He's just angry at him. He's just mad. He knows God is there. He knows what the Lord asks, asks of him. He's just upset by it. He's upset by the Lord's providence in this situation. And so he kind of tries to take a break from God. He's going to go on vacation from God. Get away for a few days. And I wonder if any of us have felt in any way similar in our lives. Perhaps there's a season in which we're just sort of angry with the Lord and his providence. That we don't get it. That his providence may seem cruel. That we know what the Lord would have us do, but we don't want to do it. Perhaps it's even just a day where you feel that way. Uh, Anne from the beloved series Anne of the Green Gables was famous for having what she called Jonah days. Uh, Days in which life felt, and I quote, flat, stale, and otherwise unprofitable. Perhaps you feel that way. But what we can learn from Jonah, and perhaps even just a moment of self-reflection, is that no matter how angry you are with God, you cannot outrun him. Though you may try, you cannot outrun him. You cannot thwart the purposes of God. Because not only is God everywhere, and perhaps you remember the words of David in Psalm 139 about him going into heaven and God is there and making his bed in Sheol, and he is there. You can't escape him. He's everywhere. But he's also relentless in his pursuit. He is relentless in his pursuit of his people. No matter how hard you try to flee from his presence, for whatever reason, he finds you if it's his will. He meets you, and he will not let go. And we see that in this narrative. So as Jonah has 
thoroughly rejected the Lord, as he has done his best to flee from both the plan and the presence of the Lord, let's see how that works out for him. Let's see how that works out for him as we look at the purposes of the Lord, the final section of this chapter. Now, remember the overarching theme of this book, for the Lord to use Jonah to demonstrate how far-reaching his love is to the Gentiles, a demonstration we see very clearly in this chapter. And lo and behold, uh, we are introduced to this lovable band of Gentiles, these mariners. I love these guys, these sailors. Uh, Jonah boards a ship with all of these other sailors, these Gentiles, and they clearly worship other gods. And that becomes clear as the Lord hurls a great wind upon the sea, and this massive storm comes about. Now remember water and the role it plays in the Old Testament. Water is always a sign of judgment and wrath. Think of, think of the flood narrative. Think of the Exodus narrative when Pharaoh's troops are drowned. Water is always judgment. And, and as this panic kind of stirs up, they hurl their cargo out of the ship. And it's interesting that they are hurling just like God is hurling, almost almost like these Gentiles are more in line with God's purposes than Jonah even is. And as this tempest comes up, they cry out to their gods. They cry out, they call out, they say, save us. And, of course, nothing happens. And so they find the one man who has not yet called out to his God, Jonah. And as we're talking about the inescapable nature of God, listen to what the captain says. So the captain climbs down into the belly of the ship, right? And Jonah's sleeping there. And he sort of shakes him awake. And he says, what do you mean, you sleeper? In other words, what are you doing? Wake up. And then the first word he says is, arise. Now, what was God's first word in this chapter? Arise. So imagine you're Jonah. You've done the best you can to flee from the Lord. You dig yourself down, down, down. You go into the belly of a ship. You're fleeing from the Lord, only to have this Gentile sailor wake you up, and the first word he says is the word of God, right in your face. It's almost funny. It's almost funny. And the sailor continues by telling Jonah to cry out to his God, the God of Israel. And he gives one reason for doing that. He says, perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. Perhaps the God of Israel will give a thought to us Gentiles. You can almost see how weighty that really is. He doesn't know what he's saying, but boy, is he right. He had no idea how true what he was saying was. Little did he know that God gave more than a thought to the Gentiles, that they may not perish. In many ways, this line captures the theme of the book, God giving a thought to the Gentiles. Now, Ninevites get all the attention in Jonah. But we mustn't forget these humble sailors, these sailors that occupy most of the first chapter, he, the Lord gives more than a thought to them. He gives them his great prophet. And we'll see how the Lord meticulously orchestrates everything in this narrative to save the sailors. The very next thing we see is the sailors casting lots to determine whose fault it is that this terrible storm has come upon us. And the lot falls to Jonah. Now, casting lots is a sort of mysterious thing. We don't know a ton about. It had something to do with sticks and throwing them on the ground, but they were always determined by the Lord. That, one, that much was undeniable. The result of the lot was determined by the Lord, and so the lot falls on Jonah by God's will. And the best thing about that happening is that Jonah knows exactly why this tempest has come. He knows exactly why the people need to throw him overboard, because it's all his fault. He was the one who fleed. 
He admitted that he was the one fleeing the sovereign Lord, the one fleeing the Lord who made the seas and the land, the very things that are, that are destroying the ship as we speak. He belongs to the sovereign Lord. And now the mariners are beginning to see that as well. The sailors are beginning to see the sovereignty of this God. And we get another one of these golden, repeated phrases. It tells us that the men were exceedingly afraid. Now the men were simply afraid, back in verse 5, of the, of the storm. They're exceedingly afraid now, and they're so afraid that they once again hurl Jonah into the sea. The storm was raging. They had no other option. Even Jonah admits it. And so they toss the prophet of the Lord into the wrathful seas. Now this wouldn't be the last time that a prophet of the Lord was delivered over to the wrath of God to save Gentiles. In many ways, this is a, a picture of Christ submitting to the wrath of God to come, the better Jonah. But the point is, notice the mariners in this narrative. They began afraid and calling out to their own gods. Then they get exceedingly afraid when they hear of the Lord and the sovereignty over the waters and the dry land and how he has sovereignty over the lot. And by the end of this narrative, these Gentile men are calling out to the God of Israel. They're begging for mercy. They're fearing exceedingly. Fearing in the sense of worship. Not just skittishness. The, the reverent fear of the covenant God, Yahweh. And ultimately, they're offering sacrifices to the God of Israel. To our God, these Gentiles in the times of Jonah, offering sacrifices to our God. Jonah, for all of his plotting and planning to thwart the purposes of God, accomplishes exactly what God means for him to do, which is to bring salvation to these Gentiles. It's incredible. It's incredible to see Jonah kick against the goads and try to thwart the purposes of God, but you simply cannot. And this first chapter is just a picture of the whole book of Jonah. We'll see it in droves in the coming weeks. And this book of Jonah is just a picture of what's to come in redemptive history when God redeems the Gentiles through his son, through his final prophet. But as we close, let us not forget these, these core lessons that Jonah 1 tells us. God's love can reach those people. We mustn't forget that. That's the lesson to the Israelites when they read this book. And that's the lesson to God's people today. God's love can reach those people. And he can use you as an agent of that love. As flawed as you may be, he can use you to speak truth, mercy, and compassion into those people's lives. Pray about who are those people in your life. And secondly, the Lord always accomplishes his purposes. Regardless of how you may fight against it, regardless of what you do, the Lord will always accomplish his purposes. And thank God his purposes are to save people like us. Thank God his purposes are to save the Gentiles, to spread his love abroad. Lord, we have a great God. We have a great God indeed. And let us go to him in prayer. <clears throat> our Lord and our God, we do thank you for the book of Jonah. We thank you that this is such a picture for us of, of your love coming to us even, your love going out into the nations. And so, Lord, we do pray that we would be an agent in your mission. We pray that we would be an agent in your purposes, that we would not flee from you, but seek to worship you and to serve you in the way we can. Lord, we pray all of these things in the name of Christ.
Amen. And now we conclude with how firm a foundation, Psalter Hymnal number 243, and let us stand as we sing. After the benediction and the closing song from uh, page 564 in the Psalter hymnal, please proceed quickly to the outside where once again we may enjoy fellowship in beautiful weather. Receive God's blessing. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love the Lord Jesus with an undying love.